are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Happy Blue Friday to all of our listeners. Glad to have you tuning in. Just a week and a half away from the start of the regular season when the Seahawks face off against the Colts at Lucas Oil Stadium. So we're inching closer and closer to real football. This is going to be a very cornerback-centric episode, a surprising trade going down this morning. Plus, I'll be chatting with John Shipley of the Jaguar Report about Seattle's newest cornerback, Sidney Jones, and where he may fit into the team's plans. So let's get rocking. The NFL season is about to begin, and nobody covers it like the Locked On Podcast Network. August 30th through September 8th, Locked On's Ultimate Season Preview is taking you through every team and every division with the help of Odyssey's Ross Tucker and Jason Lacafora. Follow the Ultimate Season Preview 2021 feed on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast to tune in beginning August 30th. Now for your lead story here on the Locked On Seahawk podcast. Even though he had yet to play in a regular season game with the team, the Akella Witherspoon era in Seattle is officially over. A trade that very few people had to see coming on Friday. It happened. Witherspoon sent to the Steelers in exchange for a 2023 fifth round draft choice. You could see some writing on the wall that maybe the Seahawks were not pleased with Witherspoon's performance over the last couple of weeks. But I don't think anybody anticipated that he was not going to be on the roster in week one. Based on some of the comments that Pete Carroll made earlier this week, it sounds like Trey Flowers is going to be the starter at right cornerback. They just moved DJ Reed over to the left cornerback spot where Witherspoon was expected to be the starter going into this season. So it looked like Witherspoon was on the outside looking in from a starter standpoint. But again, I don't think anybody anticipated that he was going to be off the roster going into week one. And yet, That is exactly what happened. If you go back to March, the Seahawks were trying to re-sign Shaquille Griffin, who had been a starter for the team in each of his first four seasons. The Jaguars gave him a three-year, $40 million contract. Seattle simply could not afford to match that. It was outside of their price range. So Griffin went to Jacksonville, and within a few hours, a deal was in place to sign Witherspoon, a player that the Seahawks have had on their radar since he was coming out of Colorado. This is a player that checks off pretty much every box the Seahawks have looked for at cornerback. He's six foot three. He's got long 33 inch arms. He's athletic. He moves really well. He's a physical player, a high football IQ. He was a player that hadn't had a lot of football experience. So a lot of people looked at him as being a high upside prospect. And yet things just didn't work out the way that the team anticipated after giving him a one year four million dollar contract they expected him to come in and be the starter to really separate himself from the pack that never happened and by the time preseason games got rolling you started to see other corners catching up with him on the depth chart and eventually he was passed and so you look at the preseason numbers three completions on eight targets against him for a little under 60 yards that doesn't look too bad, but he gave up a 35-yard reception to Jerry Judy of the Broncos on a fourth and one play, really struggled to put himself in a position to make plays on the football. And so you consider those things and what Ken Norton Jr. said a few weeks ago in his last press conference that his preseason was fair. That is not an overly encouraging assessment coming from the defensive coordinator when you've got an open competition at the position he just didn't do enough and there were enough bad plays in training camp where he got burned by Seattle's receivers that you could see there were going to be some issues with giving up big plays he's been inconsistent throughout his NFL career with the 49ers bounced in and out of the starting lineup the Seahawks hoped they could curb that and they could really bring out more consistency in this young man and it just didn't happen so this is really the latest example of John Schneider swinging and missing on veteran cornerbacks. Last year, Quentin Dunbar, they traded a fifth-round pick for him, believing he was going to replace Flowers at right cornerback and upgrade the secondary. He had legal issues all offseason. By the time he came back, he wasn't in top shape. He battled a knee injury and played in just six games. When he was in the field, he was very ineffective. A few years earlier in 2015, there was the Kerry Williams debacle. They tried to replace Byron Maxwell 
with a 31-year-old Williams that had not played in their scheme. And that worked out horribly. After 10 games, they released him because it was a disaster. He really struggled in the secondary across from Richard Sherman. So veteran corners coming in to replace starters – that has just not worked out well for the Seahawks throughout the John Schneider, Pete Carroll era. They've done a much better job when they've had young players in there that they can develop homegrown talents, which is why they were trying to keep Shaquille Griffin. He just was too expensive. And I'm not going to sit here and blame John Schneider for that. I think he made the right decision. I've said that time and time again on this podcast. As good as Griffin was in 2019, making his first Pro Bowl, He's never proven himself to be a shutdown corner worthy of the money the Jaguars decided to pay him. And Seattle had so many other things they had to address financially, whether it's bringing back Carlos Dunlap, re-signing Chris Carson, giving Jamal Adams an extension. Adding Shaquille Griffin's contract into their payroll just wasn't going to work. And so I'm not going to criticize him for that. Unfortunately, he has not been able to hit on a veteran cornerback. That does not seem to be a position where – they are destined to have success bringing somebody in that hasn't already been in their system that they've been able to develop them. So now the question is, what do the Seahawks do moving forward? I think this creates a great opportunity for Sidney Jones now coming in. I'll chat with John Shipley about expectations for him in Seattle in the third quarter. Rookie Trey Brown, he could really make this situation irrelevant if Brown comes back from a knee sprain and finds his way into the lineup. If you've got a rookie that's under club control for the next four years, that winds up starting games and plays well, then that's a really good situation. Schneider's miss on Witherspoon is much more forgivable, and now you've got an additional day three pick, two drafts from now. So it's not the end of the world, but certainly you look at the way that the cornerback group is shaking out right now. It was a question mark going into camp. It is now an even bigger question mark going into week one, and they face some very good receivers during the early part of their schedule. That group is going to be tested and the pass rush better show up to help that group or things could get pretty ugly like they did early last year for Seattle's secondary. It's unfortunate that Witherspoon didn't work out, but hopefully they learned a little bit from this experience looking at Quandre Diggs and lesser so with Dwayne Brown, two players that want new contracts that have been holding in at practice. Maybe just maybe be a wise idea to pay up, especially for Diggs right now, rather than risk potentially losing him as they did with Shaquille Griffin this past offseason. When I come back in the second quarter, I'm going to be making predictions for award winners for the Seahawks. Who's going to be the MVP, the Defensive Player of the Year, Most Improved, and a number of other different awards going into the 2021 season. You won't want to miss it. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Did you know that Built Bar has so many delicious flavors? There is something for everyone. When you talk to a Built Bar fanatic like myself, we are definitely passionate about our favorite flavors. There's a bunch of them that I absolutely love. Mint brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, my favorite cookies and cream. If you haven't tried all these flavors, you can get a mixed box where you'll get two of each of those nine flavors. And not only are Built Bar flavors the best tasting, but they're healthy too. As an avid weightlifter, I love being able to eat one of these with 17 to 18 grams of protein and only 130 to 180 calories and four to five grams of sugar. And it's also only four to five grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy. Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. Hey everyone, this is Corbin Smith from the Locked On Seahawks podcast here to let you know our episode today is supported by Alaska Airlines. Do you ever get the sudden urge to hop on a plane and head somewhere like Dubai, London, or Tokyo? I've always wanted to go to Tokyo and Japan in general. I actually used to be a 400 level Asian history major in college and I taught some courses at the high school level on Asian history so I've always wanted the opportunity to visit Japan so I could experience the food, the nature, and most importantly, the culture, the historical things in Japan. Someday I'm going to make it happen. And now it's easier than ever to get there because Alaska Airlines has joined One World. One World is a global alliance that makes it easy for Alaska mileage plan members to earn and redeem miles worldwide. Go global with Alaska Airlines and One World. Learn more at alaskaair.com slash one world. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Blue Friday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. 
Later in the show, I will be chatting with John Shipley of the Jaguar Report about Seattle's newest cornerback, Sidney Jones, and where he may fit into the team's plans in the upcoming season. But first, I'm going to hand out some preseason awards. This is something that I do annually the week before Seattle begins preparation for its opening opponent, MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, a number of different awards. I'm going to be handing these out, and we'll see how things shake out when we revisit this at the end of the season. As far as MVP goes, I'm going to give you one answer, and it has to be this answer, and that's Russell Wilson. If someone else gets MVP, this is just my opinion. That is not a good omen for how the Seahawks season played out. They need Russell Wilson to be playing at an MVP level this year for the team to be able to make a deep playoff run. Yeah, if Chris Carson's running the football well and the defense is playing well, that'll allow the Seahawks to stay in games. But they need number three to be playing at an elite level. And I really believe that this offensive scheme, coordinated by Shane Waldron, is going to bring out the best in Russell Wilson. More emphasis on the quick to short passing game. They're going to still take their shots downfield, mixing in more bubble screens, mixing in more jet motion, just motion in general. They are going to create situations of conflict for opposing defenses. And I think Russell Wilson, being the bright quarterback that he is, is going to be able to take advantage of that. I also like a few of the weapons they've added around him to go with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett already on the roster. D. Eskridge has a chance to be a big-time player right away, given his strengths, his speed, some of the things that he does that are a little different than Lockett and Metcalf. And I think Gerald Everett has a chance to be an impact player. The offensive line's been bolstered with Gabe Jackson. There's no excuses now. Russell Wilson absolutely has to be the MVP. Now, on the defensive side of the football, this is probably my second pick for MVP just based on what my expectations are for this year. I agree with Brian Baldinger, who was on our show earlier this week, that Jamal Adams, with not having to worry about his contract situation anymore, getting paid what he believes he's worth, $17.5 million per year, a record-breaking deal, that's a huge burden off of his shoulders, and he's going to be much more comfortable in this defense. He's fully recovered from his offseason surgeries. Last year, he battled a bunch of injuries. You hope he can avoid that this season, but as long as he's staying healthy, the Seahawks have a much better idea how to utilize his unique strengths, the unicorn that he is on the field. I think Jamal Adams is going to have a monumental season, number two with the Seahawks. I'm thinking first-team all-pro caliber season. We might even see him get a few interceptions this year. He had his hands on a football several times last year, but you have to remember he had cracked fingers. Very difficult to catch passes when you're playing with cracked fingers. Those have been surgically repaired. I expect that he's going to create a lot more turnovers. He's going to be a major factor once again as a pass rusher, something you don't get to say about very many safeties in this league. I think Jamal Adams, number 33, is in for a big season, and he's going to be a catalyst for that defense continuing to play the way they did the end of the second half a year ago. As far as most improved player goes, I'm staying on defense. I think you've got to go with Alton Robinson because number 98, he's one of those players that always seems to be around the football. He did it last year in limited playing time. He had a fantastic preseason, and I know he's got Carlos Dunlap and Benson Mayoa in front of him on the depth chart. But he's still going to get quite a few snaps. If they're not playing him, the Seahawks are making a huge mistake. And the fact that he's added some Sam to his repertoire, I don't expect he's going to get many snaps there, if any. But he now can play both the Leo defensive end position and the strong side linebacker spot. It gives you some versatility. He's 270 plus pounds too. He could probably play the other end position. The Seahawks have a very good player in Alton Robinson that did not play as much as he deserved last year. He's going to give you some burst off the edge, find his way into the backfield as a run defender, very underrated in that aspect, even if he's only playing 30, 35% of the snaps. I'm expecting a major uptick in production from him based on what I saw in the preseason games and during training camp. I think he's got a chance to really surprise once again in a reserve role and really add punch to this Seahawks pass rushing unit. Let's go to the trenches now, offensive and defensive linemen of the year. On the O-line, it would be easy to go with Dwayne Brown, the old standby. He's been holding in. I think he plays in week one. He will be back on the field. He didn't need those training camp practices anymore. He's 36 years old. He doesn't need those reps. He will be ready for the season opener. He's in fantastic shape. But I'm going to go with Damian Lewis. Lewis had such a fantastic rookie season. 
He was named to the Pro Football Writers Association All-Rookie Team, one of the best run-blocking guards in the entire NFL as a rookie. He had his issues in pass protection, and he led the league in penalties for guards. Going over to the left guard spot, he looked very comfortable there. We saw him bulldozing opponents in preseason games as a run blocker. Didn't get a lot of snaps, but still had several highlight run blocks in that limited time. I'm expecting him to cut down on the penalties, and I think playing next to Dwayne Brown on its own is going to help him immensely in pass protection. Even if he is just an average pass protector to go with his run blocking skills, I think there's an outside chance that Damian Lewis could be in the mix for a Pro Bowl, maybe even second team all pro. He's got that kind of upside at the guard position, really fits their scheme well. He's looked good in this offense with more wide zone. He's got more athleticism than I think a lot of people realize. So I'm excited to see what he does in year two. And on the defensive side of the football for defensive lineman of the year, I got to stay in the middle with Puna Ford. Every year we've seen him improve. Last year, though, we finally saw the pass rush that I have always believed that Puna Ford had in him because of that elite quickness and the ability to penetrate. He's developed some counter moves that he didn't have when he first entered the league. And he really benefited from playing more snaps at that three tech position a year ago. Now that Jaron Reed is no longer on the roster, he's going to be the one primarily getting those three tech reps when they're in their typical four, three sets. When they're in their bare sets, he's going to be playing a lot of three tech as well. More opportunities for him to be able to rush the passer. We saw him break out in the second half with a career high in quarterback pressures. I think he translates that into a bunch more sacks this season. And if he's able to do that, you could be looking at a first Pro Bowl for Puna Ford, one of the better young defensive tackles in the entire NFL. I think he's primed for a really big season. As far as rookie of the year goes, the Seahawks had three players in their draft class. Not a lot of options to choose from. As much as I like Jake Kieran. Hopefully, he's not going to be playing a lot of snaps along the offensive line. So he's not a contender for this. This really boils down to D. Eskridge versus Trey Brown. And I'm actually going to pick Trey Brown. I mentioned in the first quarter with the Akella Witherspoon trade, there's going to be an opportunity to play. Trey Flowers is going to have to play lights out on the right side to prevent Trey Brown from getting into the lineup. And you can make the same argument for DJ Reed. He needs to play like he did the second half last year. The Seahawks really like Trey Brown. He's one of the only corners on the roster in fact, I think he's the only corner on the roster that's under club control past this year. They are going to want to get him some snaps in the field. And if he plays well with those opportunities, you add in the fact he can contribute on special teams as both a return specialist and a coverage guy, then I think he absolutely has a chance to be their best rookie this year. And it's not that D. Eskridge could not put up big numbers. I just don't know he's going to get a lot of targets with D.K. Metcalf and Tyler Lockett already being on the outside and Gerald Everett being there as well. So Trey Brown is my pick to be Seattle's Rookie of the Year. And for the last big award here going into the 2021 season, this one actually took a lot of thought from me because the Seahawks have a number of players coming back from significant injuries. Trying to choose who's going to be the comeback player was really difficult. And initially, I was going to go with Daryl Taylor, who didn't play a single snap as a rookie last year, coming back from a surgery to repair a fractured leg. I've got to go with Marquise Blair, though, because he was the training camp MVP last August. I'm telling you, every single practice this kid was making big plays, whether he was blitzing off the edge and getting a sack on Russell Wilson or making a tackle for loss in the backfield, deflecting passes, intercepting passes, you name it. He was phenomenal last year moving to that slot corner spot. And we started to see that again in his first game action, the preseason finale. That was his first game since week two last year when he tore his ACL. The Seahawks did not get to see very much of him in the regular season. You put him back with Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs. Let those three be on the field together. Just infinite defensive possibilities for Ken Norton Jr. as far as what he can do, mixing and matching those players. So much formational flexibility. I just think Marquise Blair is ready for a big season. And the thing that he's really good at that I don't think gets a lot of attention because he only had one interception in his college career at Utah, he is much more capable of creating turnovers than what those numbers would dictate. Again, he was making interceptions, breaking up passes left and right in training camp two years ago. You could see signs of that this year in camp. He did miss some time with a bruised knee, but once he came back, you saw the playmaker in that preseason finale. I think he can get his hands on two or three interceptions minimal, 
And I also think he's a guy that you can continue to get snaps in the box. You can use him to help your run defense. He's got enough physicality to defend tight ends. So I'm really excited about Marquise Blair. You just got to hope he can stay healthy. That's been the one thing holding him back. He just hasn't been available. But if he can stay on the field and the Seahawks are able to maximize his skills, he can truly be the difference maker this defense did not have at all in the 2020 season. When I return to the third quarter, I'm going to be chatting with John Shipley of the Jaguar Report. He's going to tell me everything he knows about Sidney Jones, who spent last season with the Jaguars. It really was a breakout season of sense for him. I'm going to be talking to John about where Sidney fits into Seattle's plans and his chances of starting and much more. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, and contests, including online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest $200,000 NFL survivor contest. Open now at Bet Online. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus and make sure to check out their opening day promo. Make a bet on the season opener on September 9th between the Buccaneers and the Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25 for new customers only when signing up and using promo code NFL100. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. So don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. Welcome back to the Locked On Seahawks podcast, Blue Friday edition. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to bring in a good friend that works for Sports Illustrated and Maven, just like I do, covers the Jacksonville Jaguars for the Jaguar Report, John Shipley. John, it's been a long time, first time really that I've had you on the podcast, and I'm really excited to actually put a face with a name here. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. I I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, we 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 we've known each other, for, uh, you know, for several years now, and you know, you you killed over in Seattle. So glad to be on, man. So the Seahawks made a trade on Monday, bringing in cornerback Sidney Jones. And I'll admit, I know quite a bit about Sidney from his time at UW, starring for the Huskies, two-time first team All Pac-12 selection, was an All-American selection as well his junior year, but. I'll admit, I haven't followed him too closely in the league playing for the Eagles. Then last year with Jacksonville, this is a player that had a lot of injuries leading up to last season. That was the reason the Eagles moved on from him. But it really seemed like he found himself in Jacksonville, even if he did miss a few more games with injury. When he did play, he was one of the few bright spots on that defense in a year that there weren't very many of those. Yeah, no, he was easily Jacksonville's uh, best cornerback last season. You know, he he was a starting level cornerback last season. You know, I I go back to his game against uh, Houston. You know, Brandon Cooks, you know, one of the more underrated receivers in the league. You know, especially as a dynamic uh, deep threat. You know, he he was able to really eliminate Cooks from the game and you know get Deshaun Watson trouble. And that, that was in his first start as a Jaguar. So you know, he found a lot of success in their scheme last season, you know, that had a lot more cover three, a lot more, you know, zone coverage than their current scheme does. And their current scheme essentially is asking corners be put onto an island, you know, one-on-one man coverage really across the board. And, you know, while Sydney, you know, excels at, you know, physical coverage, it's just for whatever reason, you know, this preseason, it seemed like he was, you know, on the receiving end, you know, a lot of big plays, you know, against Dallas, he gave up a touchdown to Aaron Patrick, I believe. But he's a guy who, he you know, he has great ball skills you know he's really physical at the catch point he's a willing tackler and he was really really well liked inside uh the jaguars building you know i i, I know um the decision to you know trade him wasn't one that was an easy one because you know he was a guy that was right there you know to be you know on the roster yeah it's interesting when you just look at the scheme differences because he doesn't check off all the boxes from a physical standpoint the seahawks normally look for not quite those 32 inch arms they have kind of diverted from that the last year or so bringing in players like DJ Reed and Trey Brown, but he checks off a lot of the other boxes as far as the type of players they're looking for. Now, looking at the film, there were a few things that jumped out to me from last year. You mentioned the big plays. That is something that Pete Carroll will not stand for, and he gave up over 21 yards per reception last year. And yeah. So in, in your opinion, was that just kind of a fluke? Because early in his career, even in you know Philadelphia not playing a lot of snaps, 
he didn't give up near that much yards per catch. Was was it more of a fluke in your eyes, or is this something that he's really going to have to get figured out? Because I'll tell you what, in Seattle, you're not going to be playing if you're giving up plays over the top consistently. Pete Carroll cannot tolerate that. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. It, it was a thing that it was more on a case by case basis. You know, I know, uh, for instance, one of those plays was a, I believe it was a 78 yard touchdown by, you know, Marquez Valdez Scantling. You know, any big play like that is going to, you know, skew the numbers a, a, a decent bit toward the higher level. So he definitely, you know, had a penchant for giving up some big plays over the top last season. But I think a big part of it was the fact that, you know, he was frequently facing, you know, especially when CJ Henderson was injured. He's frequently facing, you know, each opposing team's best deep threat, the best overall receiver. And he was doing it on the defense that was second to last in the NFL in sacks, you know, we're way down the bottom in the NFL in pressure rate. And then just across the board, you know, you, you look at their, all the individual defenders and the defense as a whole, you know, they, they couldn't stop the pass in general. So I think he was more kind of a product of, of a bad defense than it was him simply getting beat. And I think his, you know, high end plays kind of show that. Looking at where he fits in Seattle, I know obviously you cover Jacksonville, haven't had a chance to really look at the corners that Seattle has, but you do have Seattle's longtime starter in Shaquille Griffin now. So there's been a lot of Seahawks find their way down to Jacksonville. Looking at where Sidney Jones fits on this defense, I, I love that you mentioned the scheme stuff because Todd Wash was on Pete Carroll's staff yeah. for a couple of years before he ended up in Jacksonville with Gus Bradley and then was the defensive coordinator. So there is going to be some crossover there as far as what that scheme looked like and what the Seahawks run. But which side do you think he's best suited for? Because Pete Carroll said he's going to get a shot at both left and right cornerback. Is there a side that you think he's best equipped to handle and – do you see him potentially being able to work his way into a starting role? Because I can tell you right now, they've gotten no clarity at the cornerback position. It had to be the biggest disappointment for this team in training camp. Yeah, no, absolutely. The Jaguars, you know, were predominantly using Shaquille Griffin, you know, throughout training camp as their, you know, the number one cornerback, you know, that kind of field cornerback, the guy who, you know, you're leaving out wide on an island. So I, I think Jones probably fits best as the guy across from that. You know, he got some reps inside at nickel throughout the training camp, but he's better off as an outside guy. You know, he was really competing with C.J. Henderson for, you know, that boundary corner role. And I, 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 I personally believe, you know, like you mentioned with the scheme that, you know, Sidney Jones is a good, a, a great fit. You know, just you know, he doesn't have the arm length like you mentioned, but he has ball skills. He's a physical player. And I, I really think that, you know, in Seattle's defense where, you know, they're looking for guys who can generate, you know, big plays consistently. It, if As long as he can cut down the, you know, he's giving up the big plays. I think that, you know, you're going to see him being a great fit in their scheme because we saw him thrive in this in that scheme last year you know if it, if it wasn't for injuries I last year you know to limit him to eight games I firmly believe he would have signed um elsewhere this offseason not in Jacksonville and would have signed you know for a decent deal because you don't see talented corners who were you know top 50 picks a few years ago you know usually go as unsigned or for a cheap one-year deal for agency and real quick, I want to touch on Shaquille Griffin just because a number of our listeners have been asking. I have not had a chance to watch Jacksonville at all in the preseason. You and I both know that when you're covering a team, you don't have a lot of time to look at yeah. team. But a lot of our listeners have been wondering what your initial impression of Shaquille Griffin has been because he was very popular here. So a lot of fans, they want to know how he's looked out there just because he was just such a great guy off the field and obviously gave the Seahawks four really good seasons. Yeah, no, he's he's extremely popular in Jacksonville. You know, he's quickly become one of uh, Urban Meyer's kind of guys in the locker room, you know, one of his leaders of the locker room, leaders of the defense. You know, he kind of automatically, you know, from when he stepped in in free agency, immediately became, you know, one of the voices of their, you know, kind of new locker room, new regime. So he, he's really one of their premier faces, one of their premier voices in the locker room. Uh, he, he had an incredible training camp, you know. He was making plays routinely in training camp, especially down the field. You know, he, he, he won. One, I would say he won more often than not against uh, DJ Chark, for example, who's the Jaguars' best uh, big play receiver. Uh, in preseason, didn't have as much success, you know, gave up two touchdowns against the New Orleans Saints. I know his PFF grades aren't as good, but I, I know the Jaguars are high on his ability to, you know, kind of hang in man coverage one-on-one. You know, they really like his speed, his size. And, and so far, you know, there's been nothing but great reviews from Jacksonville on Shaquille Griffin. So, And he's been a guy that's been really liked by, you know, not just the team, but the fan base. 
I know Seahawk fans, a lot of them out there, they're starting to wonder, did the Seahawks make the right decision letting him go? Way too early to be making those kind of statements. And obviously the contract Jacksonville gave him made it pretty difficult for the yeah. Seahawks to be able to fit that into their salary cap and be able to keep some of the other players that they were able to bring back this season. John, I greatly appreciated the chance to chat with you and uh, we'll see what Sidney Jones does. I have a feeling that this is a trade that could work out really well for the Seahawks. The key is going to be, of course, as you mentioned, can you prevent some of those big plays? And most importantly, can he stay on the field? Something he really has yeah. struggled to do his first four seasons. And I, I really like the deal for Seattle for that reason, because, you know, he's a he, he's obviously on a cheap one-year deal. But as long as he's healthy, I believe you have a starting caliber cornerback. You know, getting that for a six-round pick, I believe is a win. I, I, I understand why Jacksonville moved on from him because, you know, they had a numbers crunch. He wasn't really an inside guy, and he lost the outside job to C.J. Henderson. But I really do like the fit in Seattle with him. And as long as he stays healthy, I think Seattle's going to be pleased with him. Music to Seahawks fans' ears. A potential starting cornerback because this past month, I don't know that we have seen one <laughs> emerge out here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. John, it's been awesome. Great to chat with you. And looking forward to having you on the show again later this season when these two teams face off on Halloween. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'm excited to come on after uh, Jake Luton gets his NFC Player of the Week honors. <laughs> Betting on the NFL doesn't have to be a guessing game. If you listen to the new Locked On Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling, get daily picks, blowout specials, wrong team favored picks, and Lee Sterling's lock of the day, follow the Locked On Bets podcast brought to you by betonline.ag. Wherever you get podcasts, you can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can check out Locked On Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the all-new Odyssey app. That's AUD. ACY. Coming up after our bye weekend, Rob Rang and I will finally dive into the season opener. We're going to start exploring what to expect from the Indianapolis Colts. Plus, we'll be tackling your mailbag questions. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for tuning in. Go Hawks.